Good morning. All right. So we are going to pick up where we left off. Um, this is section 1.8. I did skip over example four um, because it's very similar to the previous example that we did. Um, it's just already factored. So I want to go ahead and start looking at example five here. Again, our goal for this week is to try to finish up um, 1.8 and then 1.9 and 1.10. I'm probably then going to review on Monday. Um, so there is a practice test that's posted if you want to start looking at that. Um, but we'll go through that on Monday, um, and then the test will be posted on Monday night of next week, and then you'll get um, until Wednesday night at midnight to finish that. Okay, so you have 48 hours from the time it's posted to find yourself a two-hour window to sit down and take it. Okay, so that's when it's going to be due. We'll just plan on that um, either next Tuesday or Wednesday, finding a time to sit down and take your test for Chapter 1. Um, continue to work on homework, obviously. Let me know if you've got questions on any of that. Um, I'll adjust due dates as needed. Um, but, you know, definitely keep working on that. So any questions, comments, concerns, though, before we get started today? All right. So here we've got an inequality, and this is going to be rational, right, because we have a 1 plus x over 1 minus x, that fraction on the left, and we want to solve that inequality, right? So finding all the values of x that would work for the inequality that's given. Now, first thing we always want to do, if you remember back to last week, anytime we've got an inequality like this, we always want to move everything to one side. Okay, so I'm going to move the 1 over to the left, which is going to give us 1 plus x over 1 minus x minus 1 greater than or equal to 0. Whenever you have some type of inequality that's not linear, right? So if you just had an X in there, right, then you can just get X by itself. In this case, because we've got X's in a numerator and denominator, in the previous example we had, you know, an X squared or an X cubed, that's when we want to actually move everything to one side first. Now, once we've done that, the next thing I want to do with this one is find a common denominator so I can actually put all of this stuff together. So looking at my terms now, what would be the common denominator that we would want to use here? One minus X, good. And so looking at the one now, what am I going to have to do to one to get a common denominator of one minus X? Okay. All right, so let's think about it this way, right? So I've got my 1 plus x over 1 minus x. That's not going to change because that's already got the common denominator. I need this next term to have a common denominator of 1 minus x. So what would I have to do to the 1 to get that common denominator now? Exactly, right? So you'd have to multiply top and bottom by 1 minus x. So in this case, you're multiplying the numerator by 1 minus x, and you're multiplying denominator by 1 minus x. We can think of this as like 1 over 1. And so what's our numerator going to be then? Okay, so not negative 1 plus x, right? What did I actually multiply by? 1 minus x. Now, when we distribute the minus, right, then that's what's going to happen. But for right now, in the fraction itself, it's just going to be a 1 minus x. Okay, so I think, Matthew, you were probably thinking about distributing the minus sign, and that's correct, right? That's what we're going to do next. But for the fraction itself, it would just look like that. Okay, greater than or equal to 0. Now let's put them together. Okay, so we're going to put these two fractions together. Now that I have my common denominator, 
that's going to give us a 1 minus x down here. And so when I do this, we have to remember that we're subtracting both of the terms in that numerator now. So if I do that, what are we going to end up with? Just 2x, good, right? Because we have a 1 minus 1, the 1s are going to cancel, and then we're going to have an x plus x because the minus a negative x gives us a plus, and so combining that now gives us 2x, greater than or equal to 0. Any questions on how we got up to that point? All right, now, if you recall last week when we did something with polynomials, okay, what we ended up doing once we had our factors was we set each factor equal to zero. We're going to do the same thing here. So once I get my numerator and denominator and there's nothing else I can do to factor them or simplify them, I'm going to take each one of those and set it equal to zero. So we're going to have 2x equals zero and 1 minus x equals zero. Again, this is just going to give us our values for our number line in our table so that then we can just check for our positives and negatives. And so what's that first equation going to give us as our solution? Zero, right? Because you would divide both sides by two. That would give us x equals zero. And then what about the other one? x equals 1, right, because I can just add the x to the other side, or if you want to move the 1 first, that's fine. You'd still have to divide by a negative. Either way, you're going to get x equals positive 1. All right, now that I have those values, now I'm going to create my number line. I'll make a number line here. I'm going to put those two numbers on it. 0 is the smaller of the values, and then 1. All right, now we have to choose our test points to determine where is this thing positive and where is it negative. Okay, so why wouldn't it be 1 over 1 minus x? So all I care about are the factors that would give me 0 because that's where my interval is going to break. And so it doesn't matter that it's in the denominator in this case. I still want to figure out what that value is going to be because that could be a breaking point of one of my intervals. Okay, so these are what we basically call critical numbers. And it just tells us where we want to divide up our intervals, that's all. Okay, so even though that factor's in the denominator, we're still just gonna set that factor equal to zero. Okay. All right, now, in this case, I need to choose a value first that's to the left of zero, right? Because I need that first interval. So what value could I choose in that interval? Negative one works, okay? So I'm gonna substitute a negative one here. And remember, if you wanna use the table, feel free, right? It's not required. But if we were to do that, we would have three intervals this time. And then we would have our two factors and the final answer, right? So our factors would be 2x, 1 minus x, and then overall is 2x over 1 minus x. And then our intervals up here would be negative infinity to 0, from 0 to 1, and from 1 to infinity. And we said for this first one, we can test negative 1. All right, so now we're just substituting the negative one into each of our factors to determine if we have positives or negatives. So if I substitute negative one into my first factor of 2x, is that going to give us a positive or a negative? Basically, 2 times negative 1 would be a negative, and so I know this right here is going to be a negative. 
Now I'm going to substitute it into the next factor, 1 minus negative x, or sorry, 1 minus x, which is 1 minus negative 1. Is that going to give us a positive or a negative value? It's going to come out positive, right? Because that's going to become 1 plus 1, which is 2, so that's actually a positive. Now, all we have to do again is count up the number of negatives because an odd number of negatives is negative, an even number of negatives would be positive. How many negatives do I have this time? One. Is one an odd or an even number? Odd. So overall, this thing should be what? Negative. So that tells me that the fraction 2x over 1 minus x is going to be a negative this time. And you could probably see in this case, right, 2x is negative, 1 minus x is positive, a negative over a positive is a negative. Okay, but again, there will be times when we've got, you know, five factors, and so it's easier just to count up the number of negatives rather than really thinking through, you know, multiplying or dividing all those things. All right, so now we have our first interval. This one down here is going to be negative. Now we need a value between 0 and 1. So what value could we use between 0 and 1? 0.5, okay? So if I use 0.5 here, again, I'm asking myself first, for the top factor 2x, is that going to be a positive or a negative? So 2 times 0.5, is that positive or negative? It's going to be a positive, good. Then we're going to have 1 minus 0.5 as our next factor. Is that going to be positive or negative? It's also positive. And so in this case, the 2x over 1 minus x should be what? Positive, right? There's no negatives this time. Everything's positive, so overall it should be positive. That tells me this interval here is going to be a positive. And then finally, we need a value somewhere in the interval from 1 to infinity. So what value could we use there? 2 works. If I plug in my 2 now into that first factor, 2 times 2, is that going to be positive or negative? That's going to be positive. 1 minus 2, is that going to be positive or negative? Good. And then in this case, we have 1 negative, which means overall this should be what? It's going to be a negative. Good. So down here now, that interval is going to be negative. All right. Now we just need to determine which intervals do we actually care about. Do I want positive values or negative values for this inequality? Positives, right? Because if you look right here, we want this to be greater than or equal to zero. So in this case, I only care about the positives. The only place I had a positive on my number line was right here. So what would that interval look like? Okay, so it's going to go from 0 to 1. Now we have to determine brackets and parentheses. Now this one's a little different from the previous one that we did. We have to be careful. If I substitute a 0 into that expression, right, so if I come back up here to the 2x over 1 minus x, what's 2 times 0 over 1 minus 0? it's going to give us zero, right? Because that would be zero over one, which is equal to zero. Is that value okay? Yeah, right? Because this could be greater than or equal to zero. That one checks out. So yes, zero is going to be included. So I'm going to put a bracket on zero. Now I want to do the same thing with one. I'm going to substitute one. So that's two times one over one minus one. What's that going to give us if we do that? 
2 over 0. What's 2 over 0? Undefined, right? Because we can't divide by 0, and so this would actually be an undefined answer. So can we include the 1 in our solution? We cannot, right? Because 1 would make it undefined. It wouldn't make it equal 0. So 1 actually has to get a parenthesis this time. So don't just assume because it's greater than or equal to or less than or equal to that everything's going to be brackets. Anything that comes from the denominator now, any of those factors, can't be included because they would make the denominator equal zero. And so our final solution is actually going to look like this right here now, from zero to one, including the zero, but not including the one. Um, I, I usually draw the number line at least. I don't do the entire table, right? I just make the number line and then I choose my values and just go, okay, yeah, if I plug in a negative one, it's going to come out negative. If I plug in a 0.5, it's going to come out positive. If I plug in a two, it's going to come out negative. And I just set up my number line that way, right? So you still, you have to, you know, combine everything, get your factors, figure out those critical numbers, and then you have to choose values in each interval, but once you do that, right, I don't set up the entire table. I just kind of do the substitution in my head to figure out where it's positive and negative at that point. Okay. Yeah, so like I said, you know, everything over here, this is kind of optional. It's an organizational tool for you if it helps you to figure out what's positive and negative. Um, but if you can just figure out your positives and negatives on the number line, that's fine too. Okay. But again, on this one, the big thing to be careful of is what's included and what's not, okay, because anything that gives us zero is fine. Anything that's undefined is not. So if it comes from the denominator, make sure you don't include that value. Any questions on that one now? All right, absolute value inequalities. Okay, so if we have an absolute value that's less than some C value in this case, we can actually set up inequalities that look like this right here, negative C less than X less than C. Another way to write that would be to say that X is less than C and X is greater than negative C. So if you actually want to write it as two separate inequalities instead of one compound inequality like that, either way is fine, and we can still solve it the same way. Now, in general, when we have something that looks like that, what's going to happen is we're going to have open circles at C and negative C because it's just less than, right? And then this and statement is actually going to give us everything shaded between those two values, C and negative C. Now, the second one here, absolute value of X less than or equal to C, same thing. If you wanted to write it, you could say X is less than or equal to C and X is greater than or equal to negative C. The only difference this time is that our endpoints are included, right? Because it's less than or equal to. And so we would shade in the C and the negative C, but it's still everything in between. Now, Number three and number four, whenever we have a greater than or a greater than or equal to, that becomes an or statement. And so we're gonna have X is greater than, so the other way to write this would be X is greater than C or X is less than negative C, right? And if we do that, we're still gonna have those open circles at C and negative C because it's just greater than, but now we're gonna end up shading in opposite directions because X could be greater than C or X could be less than negative C and so now instead of the overlap between them, we actually get these arrows going in opposite directions. And the same thing with number four. The only difference here is that it's greater than or equal to. And so we would include those endpoints. Okay, but we're still getting that or statement where everything's shaded out, right? So to the right of C and to the left of negative C. So in general, right, if you have a less than or a less than or equal to, it's an and statement. 
If you have a greater than or a greater than or equal to, it's an or statement. And that should give you an idea of what those graphs are probably going to look like. All right, so let's take a look at this one. So now we want to solve our inequality. We've got absolute value x minus 5 less than 2. All right, so first things first, is this an and statement or an or statement? It's an and, right? So anytime you have a less than, this is going to give us an and. Now I'm just going to set up my two inequalities that I would get from this. Now one of them is just going to be exactly as is dropping the absolute value bars, right? So I'm going to have x minus 5 less than 2. That's my first inequality. Notice all I did, drop the absolute value bars. Now the other inequality, I'm going to keep what's inside my absolute value bars. So that's still x minus 5. But then I have to flip my sign and change the sign on the 2 on the other side. So this becomes greater than negative 2. So whenever you've got an absolute value inequality like this, first just identify is this an or statement or an and statement? Anything with a less than or a less than or equal to is an and, greater than or greater than or equal to is an or. Then you can drop your absolute value bars to get your first inequality, and then we do the same thing but flip the sign, right, to make it greater than, and change the sign of the number on the other side, and that's where we get the negative two. Now we just have to solve, right? So if we solve the first one here, what's that going to give us? Good, so add the 5, and that's going to give us x is less than 7. And over here, if we do the same thing, add the 5, what's that going to give us over here? Good, x has to be greater than 3. All right, now I'm going to draw my number line first, and then we're going to get our um, solution set in interval notation. So if I were to graph this now, what would our graph look like if x is less than 7 and x is greater than 3? Exactly, right? So we're going to have 3 and 7 on our number line. Open circles, good, at 3 and 7, because we don't want to include those values. There is no equal to here. And then oh, I want to be greater than 3 but less than 7. That means I'm shading everything between 3 and 7 this time. All right, now that we have the number line, now let's write our interval notation. What would the interval notation look like for this solution set? Perfect, right? So parentheses 3 to 7, close parentheses. Again, we're not including either one of the endpoints, but we want to include all the values between 3 and 7 here. So again, what this tells us now is that every single value between 3 and 7, except for 3 and 7, would work if I were to substitute them into that absolute value inequality now. If every value I choose between there should give us an absolute value that's less than 2. Any questions on that one now? All right. Let's take a look at this one. So absolute value 3x plus 2 greater than or equal to 4. All right, 
So first step, first off, is this an or or an and statement this time? Okay, this one's gonna be an or, right? Because in this case, it's greater than or equal to, so it's gonna be an or. Now, what would our first inequality look like? Okay, so we're gonna have 3x plus two greater than or equal to four, right? Because again, all we're doing is dropping the absolute value bars. Then we can solve that one. Let's go ahead and get the other inequality first, right? And then we'll solve both of them. What's the other one gonna be then? I know it's gonna be 3x plus two again. It's gonna be less than or equal to, and then what do we have to do to the four though? Make it a negative, right? So that's gonna be negative four instead. So just don't forget when you flip the sign, you also have to change the sign of your number on the right-hand side. All right, now let's solve. Okay, so for this first one here, first step, subtract the two. We're gonna have three X greater than or equal to two, and then we could do what? Good, and if we divide by three here, X, in this case we divide it by a positive, so our sign stays the same, greater than or equal to two thirds. So there's part of our solution. Steps are gonna be the same for the other one. Subtract the two. We have three X less than or equal to negative six. And so when I divide by three this time, we have X is less than or equal to, and then negative six divided by three, is gonna give us a negative two. Again, don't flip that sign, because in this case we divided by a positive value, so even though the answer comes out negative, right? We did the dividing by a positive, the sign stays the same, it's still less than or equal to. Any questions up to that point? All right, now let's think about our number line. I'm gonna put my two values on there. The negative two is the smaller value. Two thirds would be up here then. Now, let's start with circles, right? So are our circles gonna be open or closed this time? Closed, right? So both of those values are included. So closed circle at negative two, closed circle at two thirds. And now the negative two, are we shading that to the left or to the right? to the left of negative two, right? Because we want to be less than or equal to negative two. And then the two thirds, is that shaded to the left or to the right? It's gonna to be to the right two thirds because we want to be greater than or equal to two thirds. So that's what our number line would look like. And again, in general, when you have an or statement, it's gonna be something like that, right? Because you're gonna be going in both directions, including all of your values, right? Not just the overlap. Now, once I have that, now let's talk about interval notation. What's my first interval gonna look like? Good, so negative infinity, and remember infinities always get parentheses to negative two. Is negative two gonna be a bracket or a parenthesis? Good, it's gonna be a bracket, right? Because we are including it this time. And then we need another interval now that looks like what? Okay. 
Good, so two thirds to infinity. Again, including the two thirds, we use a bracket. Infinities always get parentheses. And then because we've got multiple intervals at work here, what do we have to put between them? The union symbol, good. Just don't forget your union. And so this right here would be our solution set to that inequality. Again, this means that any value less than or equal to negative two and any value bigger than or equal to two thirds will work for the original inequality if you were to substitute it in there. Any questions on that one now? All right, so that's where we're going to stop in section 1.8. We're going to move into 1.9. Now 1.9, we're looking at the coordinate plane and then graphs of equations and circles. Okay, so three different topics here okay, that all kind of go together. Um, so first start with the coordinate plane, what that means, and we'll get into graphs of equations, and then we'll also look at circles towards the end of this section. Okay, so we'll get as far as we can into this section, um, and then we'll pick up wherever we leave off on Wednesday. Okay, so first off, the coordinate plane. So the key things we need to understand about the coordinate plane is one, how do we label what we call the quadrants of our coordinate plane? And then what do we know about values within each of those? Okay, so if we look here, we're always gonna start in this first quadrant, okay? And we use Roman numerals, so Roman numeral one is gonna represent that upper right quadrant. Now, in that quadrant, everything is going to be positive. The X values are positive there and the Y values are positive there. So our ordered pairs are always gonna be positive positive. Now, when we start numbering, we always go counterclockwise, meaning the opposite direction of a clock. So I'm going to go over here now. This is going to be my second quadrant, which we use a Roman numeral two. In that case now, X values are going to be negative. Y values are going to be positive. So all of my ordered pairs here are going to be negative, positive. If we keep going counterclockwise, then we're going to end up with the third quadrant down here now. In this quadrant now, to the left and down, everything's going to be negative. The X values are negative and the Y values are negative. So we have negative, negative for the ordered pairs. And then we have our Roman numeral four. That's the fourth quadrant. In this case now, we're on the positive X side, but the Y values are still negative. So that would be positive, negative in that quadrant. Again, always start in the upper right, that's quadrant one, and then we go counterclockwise to number the quadrants. Okay. And you can see over on the right there, just some ordered pairs and how we would actually label them. So notice here, we went to the right one unit and then we went up three units. And so that ordered pair right there would be positive one, positive three. So your X value always comes first, Y value always comes second. And again, you can see in each of these, right, this one has a negative X and a positive Y. Here we have a negative X and a negative Y. And this one over here has a positive X and a negative Y. And then we do have some cases where points are actually on the axes. Okay, so notice here we went to the right five units, but we're on the x-axis, so the y value is actually zero. You could have something similar where you have a value on the y-axis, the x value then would be zero, and the y value would be wherever you are on the y-axis. So I'm assuming that you have some understanding of the coordinate plane and how to plot points and that kind of thing, right? But I always like to review um, just to make sure it's clear. So the keys here are, Make sure X comes first, Y comes second, right? So when you're plotting these points, you're always going left or right first, and then up or down second. Okay, so that's how we make sure we put our points in the right place. All right, we're gonna skip example one. 
right? Distance formula. Okay, so the distance between any two points, x1, y1, and x2, y2, so we have two points, a and b, in the coordinate plane is going to be this formula here. Okay, so we're going to take the x2 minus the x1, we're going to square it, the y2 minus the y1, we're going to square it, add those values together, take our square root, and that's going to actually give us the distance between our points. Now, another way to think about this is if I were to have points plotted in the coordinate plane. So I'm just going to make up some random points here. Right? So let's say I have a point 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. It's right up here. And then let's say I have another point. I'm going to go negative 3, negative 4, and put another point down here. I'm going to let this be my A, this be my B. So again, this would be negative 3, negative 4, because we went to the left 3 and down 4. This point over here would be positive 4, positive 3, because I went to the right 4 and up 3. Now, if I don't know the distance formula, I could still figure out what the distance is between those two points. And the way I would do that is I would actually create a triangle to represent this distance here, right? Because that's what I'm trying to find is the length of that distance between those two points. So what I could do is I could actually drop a vertical line down like this, and then draw a horizontal line over like this, and I can actually create a right triangle. Now, here's what I want you to tell me. That vertical height of my triangle on the right-hand side there, what would that length be? Okay, almost. So be careful there. So we got four units down at the bottom and only three units up at the top, right? So it's only going to be seven units total. So this side length over here would be seven. Now, what about the bottom piece down there? How long would that side be? It's going to be the same thing, right? Because I have three units on the left, four units on the right. And so if you just count that total, that side length is going to be seven. Now, knowing the lengths of those two sides, how could I find the length between A and B at that point? It is a 45, 45, 90 triangle, right? So if you under, if you know any trig at all, right, you can actually figure this out. What if you don't know trig, though? What could you do? Pythagorean theorem, right? So we know, in this case, with a right triangle, we can actually use a squared plus b squared equals c squared to help us find the length, in this case, of our d value, right? Because that would be the distance between the two. That's going to be like the c value in our equation. This would become 7 squared plus 7 squared equals d squared. And then we would just simplify that, right? So 7 squared we know is 49 plus 49 equals d squared. Adding those together now is going to give us 98 equals d squared. And so then we would have to do what? Take the square root, right? And so we'd end up with the square root of 98 is equal to d. Notice here, I don't need a plus or minus because I know I'm looking at an actual length of something, and so it's going to be a positive value no matter what. And then we would want to see if we can break this down. In this case, I know I added two 49s together, so I know that this is actually 2 times 49. And what's the square root of 49? 7, right? So I can bring out the 7, keep the square root of 2, and so that would be my length 
between A and B or the distance between those two points now. Now, what I want to show you is this distance formula is nothing more than Pythagorean theorem. Okay? Because if you think about it, if I were to do x2 minus x1, well, this would be my x1 and y1 value here. This would be my x2 and y2 value here. And so if I substitute those in and do x2 minus x1, that's going to be negative 3 minus 4 squared plus, and then y2 minus y1 is going to give us negative 4 minus 3 squared. And the square root around the whole thing. What's negative 3 minus 4? It's a negative sign, right? And so this right here would give us a square root of negative 7 squared. And then negative 4 minus 3, same thing, also negative 7 squared. What's going to happen when we square a negative 7? It's positive 49, right? And so in both of these, we're going to get the square root of 49 plus 49, and notice that's basically what we've got at this step right here, right? We just haven't taken the square root yet, but we're going to eventually have to in that formula we've got at the bottom. But in general, all this is doing is helping us to find the lengths of those two sides. That's what the subtraction does. We're squaring both of our sides, we're adding them together, and then eventually we have to take the square root because it's like we're solving Pythagorean theorem at that point, okay? So distance formula is just a, a different way of writing Pythagorean theorem because we're working in the coordinate plane and we need a way to find the lengths of our sides. So if you forget distance formula though, you can always plot your points, draw your triangle, figure out the lengths of your sides and just use Pythagorean theorem to find the distance between them, okay? Any questions on what I've got there now? All right, midpoint formula. Okay, so our midpoint formula of a line segment from um, x1, y1 to x2, y2 is given by this formula. So basically we're just adding together the x values, adding together the y values, and we're dividing each one of those by two. In other words, we're finding the average of the x's and the average of the y's. And once we do that, we're writing that as an ordered pair. I add two values together and divide by two, that's finding an average. Add the y value, two values together, divide by two, that's finding an average. And then we just write an ordered pair for our midpoint. All right, so example three, we want to show that this quadrilateral with vertices at 1, 2, 4, 4, sorry, that ran over the line, 5, 9, and 2, 7 is a parallelogram. And the way we're going to show that is by proving that the diagonals bisect each other. Okay, now there's some geometry terms in here. Okay, basically, if something bisects something else, basically if I've got a length here, I'm just saying that it divides it in half, okay? That the two segments that that point divides it into um, actually cut that segment in half. So in general, right, if that's the case, that means that that must be the midpoint. So really all we want to show here is that the midpoints of these diagonals actually are the same point, and if they are, then they have to bisect each other. Therefore, this has to be a parallelogram. Now, Let's draw the picture, right? Because I think that actually helps to kind of see what's happening. So I'm actually going to plot all of these points and then we'll connect them to see what the picture actually looks like. All right, so one, two, we're going to go to the right one. 
we're going to go up to that first point right there, that's going to be P. All right, now my Q value, again, that's 4, 4. So that tells us we're going to the right 4. We're going up 4. And so that's going to be this point right here. That's going to be Q. All right, then our next point's at 5, 9. So that tells us right 5, up 9. So we need to extend this more. There's 5, 6, 7, 8. Should have made that a little longer. Sorry, 9. So that's going to take us all the way up here now. That's going to be point R. And then finally, 2, 7. We go to the right 2, up 7. And that's going to give us a point right in here, and that point is S. All right, so now make sure when we connect these that we're connecting them in order, right? So this is going to be P to Q, Q to R, R to S, and then S back down to P. And if you've drawn it to scale, right, you should be able to kind of see what shape we have here. We're trying to prove that this is actually a parallelogram by showing that the diagonals bisect each other. So in other words, I want to show that this diagonal right here and this diagonal right here bisect each other. Okay, so create two congruent segments okay, along the diagonals which means if that's the case, that this point right here needs to be the same, the midpoint between P and R and the midpoint between S and Q need to be the same point for that to happen. Okay, so that's all I'm really trying to show this time. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find my midpoint between P and R. All right, now, how would we find the midpoint between P and R? Okay, so we need to add the points together, divide by two, right? So in general, though, we have to start with the x's. So we're going to do 1 plus 5. We're going to divide that by 2. Then we're going to do the same thing with the y values. That's 2 plus 9. And we're going to divide that by 2. So again, I'm focused on the p value here, the r value, or sorry, yeah, p and r. All right, so if we do that now, what's 1 plus 5 divided by 2? Three, right? One plus five is six divided by two is three. And then here we have two plus nine, that's 11 divided by two. You can either write a decimal or leave it as a fraction. I don't care, either way is fine. Okay, we're gonna have 11 halves. And now just for the sake of time, I'm gonna go ahead and do the other one real quick. We have M of, and now we're looking at the midpoint between S and Q. So same formula. If I do that now, I have my S and my Q, that's going to be 2 plus 4 divided by 2, and then 7 plus 4 divided by 2. Again, simplifying that now, 2 plus 4 is 6, 6 divided by 2 is 3, 7 plus 4 is 11 divided by 2, and I'm going to leave that as 11 halves, and notice here that these are the same point. Therefore, that tells us that those diagonals have to bisect each other. And so this is indeed a parallelogram. Now, I'm not gonna give you something like that on a test because I don't expect you to know all the geometry necessarily. 
right? So just know in general, right, to find the midpoint between two points, add the x's, divide by two, add the y's, divide by two, that'll give you the midpoint. That's what you need to know. All right, so we'll stop there for today. We'll pick up um, with the rest of section 1.9 on Wednesday. Let me know if you've got any questions as you're continuing to work on homework. Again, the practice test is posted if you want to start looking at that. Um, but the test will be next week on Monday. It'll be posted, be due on Wednesday. Okay. Um, let me know if you got any questions. Otherwise, have a great afternoon and I will see you on Wednesday.